one of the least known campaigns of World War I was fought between Italy and Austria-Hungary. It was drawn out and bloody with a huge loss of life. Most of its battles took place in the alpine terrain that marked the shared border of the two countries. By the autumn of 1918, the Italians won the campaign, but it easily could have gone the other way. In October 1917, the Italian Second Army was almost annihilated in the Battle of Caporetto, high in the mountain passes. In just two weeks, the Italians were driven back 80 miles. They suffered 340,000 casualties. Thousands were taken prisoner. It was Austria-Hungary's most sensational victory of the entire war. It nearly brought Italy to her knees. The defeat was so epic, it seems inconceivable that it was caused by one man's blunders. Italian commander General Luigi Cadorna had ignored reliable intelligence reports on where the enemy was most likely to strike. Then, when the battle was about to begin, he left too many men in the front line. They were cut to pieces. Cadorna also held his reserves too far back. They were of no use when the enemy broke through the front line. When World War I started in the summer of 1914, Italy was still a monarchy. It was ruled by King Victor Emmanuel II, a friend of most European royal families. But Italy had special ties with Germany and Austria-Hungary through the Triple Alliance, a defensive pact formed in 1882. At the outbreak of World War I, the Italian government in Rome preferred to remain neutral. It stayed on the sidelines until it knew which way the wind was blowing. Its main reason for doing so was a running dispute with Austria-Hungary over the Italian-speaking border territories of Trieste and Trentino. Austria-Hungary insisted these were hers by right, Italy was not inclined to side with Austria-Hungary unless it handed the provinces over. After the June 1914 assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Italy also resented it was not consulted before Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. As Austria-Hungary mobilized, Italy accused its former ally of aggression, contrary to the terms of the Triple Alliance. But that didn't stop either Austria-Hungary or Germany from trying to win Italy over. Italian nationalists preferred to side with Britain and France, they saw this as Italy's last chance to become a major world power. They also realized that if Italy supported Austria-Hungary, Italy would be blockaded by the British Royal Navy. Italy depended on Britain for coal to fuel expansion of its industrial base. After Italy was assured that Trentino and Trieste would be returned to it, Italy signed the Treaty of London with Britain, France, and Russia in April 1915. Italy's role in the 30-year-old Triple Alliance was over. A month later, Italy declared war on Austria-Hungary. But Italy was reluctant to take up arms against the powerful Germany. Germany. 
Austria-Hungary was another matter. The Italian army outnumbered the Austro-Hungarian forces, so most Italians were optimistic. In 1911, the Italians fought a successful campaign against the Turks in Libya. They were confident of their military prowess. But by May 1915, that confidence was misplaced. The soldiers of Italy were hopelessly under-equipped, especially in artillery. In addition, the Italian troops were poorly organized, trained, and motivated. They also faced a considerable geographical disadvantage. Most of Italy's 400-mile border with Austria-Hungary consisted of inhospitable mountains and hills. The Austrians held most of the high ground. Faced with this, an experienced and capable military leader might have had second thoughts, but Italian Commander-in-Chief General Cadorna did not. He sent his hapless troops into the mountains. They would soon face a desperate and bloody struggle. In May 1915, the Italian army moved up to the largely Alpine border with Austria-Hungary. Commander-in-Chief General Luigi Cadorna was determined to launch an early offensive. He deployed his forces on two main fronts. The first and fourth armies moved toward Trentino. The second and third moved on to Isonzo, facing Trieste. 19 battalions held the line between the two main groups. Cadorna decided to launch his attack against the Isonzo Plateau. There were considerable obstacles. The slopes of the plateau gave no cover and were littered with boulders. The Italian troops would face a difficult struggle that would become harder under fire. None of this deterred Cadorna as he inspected his troops' positions high in the mountains. He ran the army in a dictatorial manner. He cracked down hard on officers he considered social inferiors and dismissed those who disagreed with his decisions. Many of the senior officers who survived his purges were too old to cope with the stresses and strains of modern warfare. They tended to leave day-to-day -day matters in the hands of inexperienced and overworked junior officers. It isn't surprising that Cadorna's early attacks on the enemy initiated his soldiers into the era of modern warfare. Starting in June 1915, the Italians made three major assaults on the Austrian-Hungarian positions. Even though they outnumbered the enemy, the Italians lacked sufficient heavy artillery to pulverize the Austrian positions. Their territorial gains were minimal. By the end of the third battle, the Italians suffered 125,000 casualties, but they inflicted 100,000 casualties on the Austro-Hungarians. Cadorna was determined to maintain his attacks. Between June 1915 and August 1917, the Italians mounted at least 11 attacks on the Isonzo front. They advanced only seven miles. Cadorna finally decided to go on the defensive. He blamed everyone except himself for the lack of progress and demoted or dismissed any officer whom he thought failed. Since Italy had declared war, Cadorna sacked more than 800 senior officers. 
Insecurity and lack of discipline filtered down through the ranks. There was virtually no one Cadorna relied on to let him know how the troops were reacting to the conduct of the war. Italy's men at the front were far from happy. They had been denied leave and spent their time gossiping and speculating on enemy plans. For their part, the Austro-Hungarians were dreading a 12th battle at Isonzo. Their commanders doubted whether their troops could hold off another Italian attack. They then decided instead to reverse the situation and launch an attack on the Italians, rather than wait for another offensive. Austria-Hungary could not have done this without the help of Germany against whom Italy declared war in August 1916. Italy did this to improve its relations with Britain and France. Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II was enthusiastic about the Austro-Hungarian offensive. He believed it could change the course of the war. His military commanders were not as enthusiastic they sought the opinion of General Kraft von Delmensingen, a mountain warfare expert. After a careful study of the Isonzo region, von Delmensingen reported that the best place for launching an attack was in the mountains around Caporetto, north of the Isonzo Plateau. The Germans and Austrians then began assembling a large force in great secrecy. They moved thousands of troops into the Caporetto area. Meanwhile, Italian commander Cadorna was worried about his rapidly dwindling ammunition. He told his allies the Italian troops would not mount any more attacks on the enemy. This surprised and annoyed the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and his French counterpart Paul Peleva. Both had lent the Italians heavy artillery. A condition of the loan was that the guns were to be used solely for offensive purposes, so the Allies demanded them back. Simultaneously, Cadorno began getting intelligence reports that the Austrians were about to make a major assault on Italy. They would not wait until the spring of 1918, which had been suggested earlier. In October 1917, Cadorno was told that the enemy offensive would almost certainly begin toward the end of the month. Its focus would be Caporetto. But Cadorna ignored the warnings. He was convinced the main attack would be at Tolmino, north of Caporetto. It was a disastrous misjudgment. Italian commander Cadorna ignored his own intelligence information regarding where the Austrians and Germans would attack Italy in October 1917. Cadorna knew that holding the front line with large numbers of Italian troops risked high casualties from the enemy's opening barrage. He ordered that units should pull back, but he failed to make sure his orders were carried out. He also held his reserves too far back to be of use if the front line was broken. These, plus Cadorna's failure to conduct proper reconnaissance of the front, were fatal errors. He should have known that four enemy divisions were assembling in the Caporetto area. The Austro-German attack began in the early hours of October 24th. The Italians were bombed, but Italian units were thrown into confusion. They were beginning to pay the penalty for Cadorna's failures.
The Germans and Austrians then attacked. Some Italian units fought back desperately. Others headed for the rear as casualties mounted. Pockets of Italian resistance were soon eliminated. The Italian line was disintegrating. And surrendered. Captain Erwin Rommel and his men captured 9,000 prisoners alone. Fleeing Italian soldiers were joined by thousands of panic-stricken civilians. Street the French and British were aghast. They sent reinforcements to rally the Italians as they retreated further and further back, pursued by the Austro-Germans. On November 3rd, Austro deemed that Italy was doomed. A presence of the enemy in their heartland, now within shelling distance of Venice, seemed to rally the Italians. Stiffened by British and French reinforcements, they stood firm at the River Piave on November 9th. But in just two short weeks, the Austro-German advance had driven the Italians back 80 miles. It had been one of the most devastating attacks of World War I. In the immediate aftermath of Caporetto, Cadorna was replaced by the younger and more flexible General Armando Diaz. Cadorna deserved nothing less for his blunders. By ignoring the whoops, he had proved himself unfit to head the armies of Italy. On being relieved of command, Cadorna typically tried to blame his subordinates for the disaster. It was a shameful end to his military career. A hard lesson was learned at Caporetto. Diaz was determined not to repeat those blunders. The Italian troops were regrouped, resupplied, reinforced, and retrained. Above all, they were re-motivated. With Cadorna gone, the British and French now renewed their support for Italy. Fresh troops and artillery began to arrive. The United States also entered the war in April 1917 and sent a small contingent. In June 1918, the Austro-Germans renewed their offensive on the River Piave. Eight days later, it ended in complete victory for the Italians and their allies. They took thousands of prisoners. In October 1918, Diaz and his Italian troops went on the offensive. Their efforts culminated in the victorious battle of Vittorio Veneto. Italian honor was restored and Caporetto was avenged. But the blunders at Caporetto would have a tragic aftermath. When the war ended, many Italians felt that their country had been led establishment. Italy did not do well in the Treaty of Versailles. It received none of the former German colonies in Africa, which the Italians thought would be theirs for fighting with the Allies. Resentment and di this came in the shape of fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, who seized power in 1922. 
Within 20 years, he led it on the side of Nazi Germany. The blunders at Caparetto cast a long shadow.